Um, yesterday, on the first day, we looked a bit more and heard about the legal and theoretical foundations um, also of international law as a law that includes and stems from um, colonial ideas and perspectives, um, which is um, partly transformed and developed to govern also contemporary uh, international relations. And um, as today in the three panels, we are turning to legal interventions in different contexts and go a bit more into practice and the concrete work of quite different um, groups from all over the world in quite different um, countries and, and court systems. Um, we will especially also discuss how legal interventions contribute and play an important role to address global injustices. Um, therein, and that's also what we see in, in, in our work, it's the European Center um, for, Constitution, um, for Constitution and Human Rights, um, where, where I work. Um, we see legal interventions as part of um, activism and engagements to address those injustices with uh, particular advantages those have and disadvantages, and I think we will also hear about those and discuss them and on, on all three panels. And um, to, to address those injustices, um, what we often do, and, and in all these cases and projects, is to form international coalitions, work together with partners and groups basically from everywhere to strengthen campaigns um, globally um, and also demands for more rights in facing powerful actors, be it states or transnational corporations in, in their global activities. So what we will talk about in a minute um, about um, legal interventions, um, but also way beyond the legal interventions, what that means, what the demands are, um, and, and why it's um, taking also to U.S. courts and not um, um, only um, to Namibian or German courts. That's, that's part, basically, um, of, uh, of, of what we also focus on um, in quite a number of different um, constellations. So when it comes to the um, very concrete cases, um, we'll talk about um, the requests for recognition, participation, reparations, uh, and especially in the last years, um, how legal interventions played a bigger role in, in the work um, of, for example, um, Esther, um, who's sitting here next to me. And um, we'll hear also from her and from Bernadus how um, the colonial rule plays uh, still a very important role in, in, in today's life um, and, and in um, in Namibia. But before we going into that, we'll have um, um, an input by um, um, Professor Krüger on, in addition to the film we've um, just shown, to give some more details, and I think there are quite some interesting points in, in the presentation um, to add, um, and then we'll have quite some time to, to discuss uh, legal interventions and, and the um, demands and activities. So let me briefly introduce the participants. Um, right next to me is Esther Muinjange, chairperson of the Ova Herero Genocide Foundation in Namibia and an activist working to create awareness of the Ova Herero Genocide locally, regionally and internationally, mobilizing for and enforcing the demand for reparations from the German government. She's a social worker by profession with more than 10 years experience in the field of social work practice and currently a lecturer at the University of Namibia in the social work department. Welcome, Esther. Thank you. Next to Esther, we have Bernardo Swartboy, who's a lawyer and activist and one of the leaders of the Landless People's Movement in Namibia. Um, set up to fundamentally reshape land policies in Namibia and to campaign for the return of properties taken during German colonialism. He's a former deputy minister for land reform in Namibia and former member of the parliament in Namibia, and he resigned over protests on land reform process and politics. Uh, welcome, Bernardus. And then to my right side is uh, Professor Gesine Krüger. Um, she's Professor of Modern History at the University of uh, Zurich. She published on the German colonial war in Namibia, on the colonial and post-colonial history of Southern Africa, and on issues of restitution and the politics of remembrance. 
Professor Krüger was a member of the advisory board of the exhibition Germany and Namibia, a shared history um, at the Rautenstoch Just Museum in, in Cologne. Um, I think that was all around the uh, 100 years um, um, commemorations, right, and anniversary. Um, so we'll start with um, your presentation before we then go a bit more into um, the panel discussion and um, also um, with opening in the end uh, for our questions of the audience. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and thank you all very much uh, for um, coming this uh, morning. I was asked to prepare a short input uh, to follow up uh, with some uh, historical and historiographical remarks on the war. Um, I will talk for 13 minutes. <laughs> A literal translation of uh, the German title of this symposium would read colonial heritage and not colonial repercussions. And that brings me to my first point. We may disagree about the precise repercussions of the colonial past in Germany today, but we no doubt look back on a shared, though often denied, colonial history, and I think we have to deal with our joint colonial heritage. In Germany, it was rather easy to forget the colonial wars and atrocities after the defeat of World War I and the consequential loss of the colonies in Africa and Asia. The colonial troops had not been part of the Prussian army or navy, and no heroes, heroes came back from the battlefields in Africa, except Paul von Leto Vorbeck, who marched through the Brandenburger Tor 20 meters away. Although quite a number of German settlers remained on board or more often dispossessed farmland in the former colonies of Southwest and East Africa, the German public was, mo was more concerned with the domestic, political, and economic crisis in Germany. The former colonies were not a key issue in the wake of the Great Depression and inflation. There was a short colonial revival in the 1930s, but Hitler was not very interested in Africa. The Nazi regime was planning to colonize first the European East to create a greater Germanic Reich. Colonial lobbyists were always active, but not at the center of domestic or foreign policy. In 1959, Hasso von Etzdorf, a World War I veteran, a high-ranking diplomat and former NSDAP member, claimed as head of the International Department of the German Foreign Office, with our colonial innocence and as highly developed economy, Germany would be the natural mediator between Africa and the colonial powers on the eve of independence. You remember 1960, the year of Africa brought about independence for 17 African nations, a growing pan-African consciousness, and a subsequent emergence of the continent as an important force in the United Nations. Meanwhile, in Namibia, since World War I, de facto under South African rule, the Odendal Plan of 1963 was implemented, a so-called development project based on racial land policy. The land question is deeply conjoined with both the beginning and the aftermath of the colonial war and the genocide. The building of a railway Line, railway line through uh, Herero land in central Namibia, the influx of farmers and the violation of land rights and plans to establish reservations were among the main causes for resistance. Other reasons had been increasing economic pressure and social degradation, especially of leading Herero families. And after the war, the Herero and Nama land was transferred to German settlers, transferred, it's a quote, with long-term loans subsidized by the German government. These farms remain the heart of Namibian capitalist agriculture to this day. 
but Bernardus will uh, later um, will later talk about the historical and present land disputes. Um, Hasse von Etzdorf's supposed colonial innocence was soon challenged in Germany by two important books published in the 1960s in East and West Germany, respectively. In East Germany, Horst Drexler's Deutsch Südwestafrika unter deutscher Kolonialherrschaft, later translated into English under the title Let Us Die Fighting, the Struggle of the Herero and Nama Against German Imperialism, came out in 1966. And two years later in West Germany, Helmut Blei published his study, Kolonialherrschaft und Sozialstruktur in deutsch Südwestafrika, translated later into Namibia under German rule. The works of Helmut Blei and Horst Drexler marked the beginning of a new and different academic colonial historiography, fo focusing not so much on the colonial center in Berlin, but the so-called African periphery in Namibia and other former colonies. The Latin American dependency theory and the work of Immanuel Wallerstein became quite influential, and colonial history shifted more and more towards an African history, at least at the history departments in Hanover and Hamburg, where MA students working on colonial or post-colonial history had to spend a year abroad at African universities and in African archives. The books of Blei and Drexler were followed by many other academic, popular and literary works on the genocide. But the colonial war seemed to be frozen in time. The silence of the graveyard was ruling, to quote Horst Drexler. This silence, however, was not so much the result of total destruction, but of untold stories and unasked questions. What happened to the surviving people of Central and South Namibia? When I did research for my PhD thesis on the aftermath of the war, I found fascinating historical material, or sources if you prefer that term. For instance, letters written by surviving Herero men and women asking about working conditions and the police at different places, or the whereabouts of friends, kin, and family. Other boxes in the archives contained endless complaints of farmers that young Herero-speaking workers on the farms were meeting after sunset to play soldiers. You just saw the Oshiderando um, in the documentary. In fact, they organized a network of mutual help and solidarity throughout the country. I found documents indicating that men were pooling their wages they got as farm workers in order to build new herds of cattle, or missionary reports about women now taking care of the holy fire, the central spiritual place of the household, because so many men had been killed in action. A reconstruction of the society took place, and alongside, a vivid culture of remembrance was established and nourished in South and Central Namibia. As you just heard in the documentary, Chief Samuel Maharero closed his eyes forever in 1923 in exile, where he spent his last years with his wife Joanna. During the war, Maharero had tried to convince Governor Leutwein whom he apparently trusted to a certain extent, to enter negotiations to end the war, in vain. And von Trotha, a counterinsurgency specialist fighting the so-called Boxer Rebellion in China, entered the stage and continued his war of extermination, a race war in his terms, Rassenkampf war sein Begriff. It was even planned to uproot and relocate the entire surviving population. All Nama should be resettled in the north and the Herero in the south. These me megalomaniac plans were never put into action. Nonetheless, the surviving war-torn, scattered and deprived people wanted to organize um, a dignified funeral for the deceased chief. 
Herero-speaking people throughout Namibia collected money to bring back the body and lay him to rest at Okahantia. The funeral became an important day of commemoration and almost every year since, two, uh, t since 1923, the Herero community is gathering at Okahantia to remember and mourn, mourn the war and to celebrate and praise their ancestors. Why I'm mentioning this again, you saw that already in the film. But I think it is of utmost importance because for many decades, this central ceremony could have been an opportunity for German-speaking Namibians or German politicians to pay respect and to recognize and acknowledge our shared history. Um, a history that started before the war and lasts until today. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have the feeling that the Herero and Nama speaking communities have been very patient concerning the denial and ignorance of official Germany about our shared history. In 2004, the Herero community received the first official but unplanned apology from the German government when Minister Heidemarie Witzorek Zoll on the occasion of the centenary of the war, for the first time used the term genocide um, at, the, uh, at the celebrations. Three years before, a first class action claim was issued in the US suing Deutsche Bank based on its financing of the German colonial administration and participating in the German colonial enterprise. Um, the Herero, furthermore, have included Wörmann line um, in the suit because it employed um, slave, labor, uh, slave labor and operated um, a concentration camp. For various reasons, the claim was not successful, and this topic will most certainly be subject to further discussions at this or following conferences. But let me quickly draw your attention to Rachel Anderson's argument she is citing the widely held view that genocidal wars waged by colonial administrations against indigenous people or nations before 1948 did not violate rules of international law. That's a wild, um, widely held uh, um, view. But uh, she is continuing, I quote, the German government um, and commentators fail to recognize that by the end of the 19th century, specific forms of genocide were already illegal under, under customary international law and multilateral treaties. So this is the juridical side. Um, but what could be the role of history and the historians in a process of legal interventions in debating forms of redress, reparations, and acknowledgement. First of all, history is debate, and there is, exists not one true history of the war. But if conservative politicians, white Namibian family historians, or apologetic academics try to prove that Lothar von Trotha did not issue an extermination order, the infamous Schiesbefehl, or that he issued a second order um, requiring his soldiers not to shoot at women and children, but to fire over their heads. We can go back to the archives and read, for instance, Ludwig van Eesdorf's objection that, I quote, it was a policy which was equally gruesome and senseless. We could still have saved many of them and their rich herds if we had pardoned and taken them up again. They had been punished enough. Um, I suggested that to General von Trotha, but he wanted their total extermination. So this is a quote from a high-ranking German officer. Another debate is centered around the term extermination. It is claimed that this is a military term, meaning total surrender or defeat. And again, the archival sources disclose, for instance, the concern of many German farmers that all future workers would be exterminated by the policy of von Trotha. 
which gives a cynical but clear evidence that the farmers, not to mention the military and the missionaries, were well aware of what was going on. As Bleis and Drexler's books were published in the 1960s, these facts, facts have now been known for at least half a century, could have been known. History is debate, a debate that should include as many voices from the past as possible. Let's turn back, for instance, to Chief Maharero, the father of Samuel, Samuel Maharero, who saw in the documentary, to Moses Witboy and Jacobus Isaac. In, 18, in 1878, six years before the region was declared German Southwest Africa and the first German colonial officers set foot, uh, foot on the shores, the chiefs discussed the threat of con colonial invasions from either the south or the north. Moses Witboy and Moses Isaac wrote in a diplomatic note to Maharero, highest noble brother and Captain Maharero, we would very much like to hear what your thoughts are on Paul Graves' intentions and his request that we should join in an alliance with him. Paul Grave was a special commissioner sent from the Cape to the far north to make contracts with the autonomous uh, chiefs in the region that became German Southwest Africa and later Namibia. The letter continues. We have heard with satisfaction that you too were against entering, entering into such an alliance with him, with Paul Grave. For see, it is our firm decision that we wish to retain our land and our people, whatever may happen. We will stand as one man for our land. Therefore, we request you to let us know your position through a letter. They are trying to keep us apart from each other. Maharero could not agree more with these wise assumptions. He himself released a proclamation in 1884, written in German and Oshihirero, and accredited with a seal, a seal that displayed a resting ox, in which he determined the borders of his territory and refused to tolerate any sale of land or granting of mining concessions not authorized by himself. As we can see here, chiefs from the south and from central Namibia debated world politics and exchanged diplomatic notes long before colonial officers even entered Namibia. Why is this important for post-colonial history and our debate today? Dipe Chakrabarti, who was uh, mentioned yesterday already, wrote in his famous Provincializing Europe that Europe is still the sovereign theoretical subject of all history. In order to challenge and change this hegemonic position, we must finally realize that Africa has a long history, as long and interesting and important as ours, and that this history is not confined to the three years between 1904 and 1907. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that gives um, definitely quite some more background and also um, already a um, um, number of points we could discuss. But um, of course, um, um, Esther, we would all like to hear from you, um, representing also the Overherrer Genocide Foundation. So what's your work there? What's your requests? Um, um, and also then, of course, coming to today, um, the negotiation process between the Namibian and the German government, but also then the lawsuit you filed um, in U.S. courts in January last year, and where we just had a hearing two days ago, and, and how you see um, or, or why you decided to go to court here um, again after the 2001 complaint, and, and um, what you expect from it, um, how it could further your, your cause and your work. Thank you very much, and a very good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Esther, as you heard, and I'm a Herero, and I'm speaking from that perspective. I'm from the victim community, 
the people that you have just seen in this documentary. For many of you, these are things that you are seeing now. But for us back home, this is the reality that we are facing every day. Every day when we have to look at some of our brothers and sisters, some of our nieces and cousins with their yellowish faces as a result of 1904-1908. Um, it's true that the Nama and Ovairo people are demanding reparation from the German government. It's a reality for us. It's not a dream. And that is a, it's a reality that we are pursuing with whatever it takes. Two thousand and four, as we just heard, Frau Heite Marie Vitzorik Zuel apologized in Namibia. And we said, was that really apology? That was confirmed when she came back to Berlin that it was not a genuine apology because she was in trouble from her own government. Why did she apologize? So as far as we are concerned, there has not been any apology from the side of the German government. Also because since 2007, the De Linke, from the time of Aydin to the time of Nima Movasat, has been putting motions in the Bundestag to say that we should recognize that it was genocide, we should apologize, and then we should pay reparation. All these motions have been rejected. That is a clear sign that the German government is very far from acknowledging this and from apologizing. 2004, the same German government came up with what they call special initiative. The 400 billions that, or 500 billions that you just saw in the documentary. That in the eyes of the German government was supposed to go to the victim communities. What happened to that money? We don't know. The, Gem the Namibian government might, may be, or they have submitted reports as to how they spend that money, because that money was channeled through the channels of the, of the Namibian government. So the, Gem the Namibian government knows what they did with that money, but the two communities never benefited from that money. We are also fully aware of an agreement between the Namibian government and the German government, which is clear that the financial and material assistance that the German government provided to Swapo then, during the liberation struggle, plus the development aid that will be given to the Namibian government, newly fi reparation. So make sure, Namibian government, that the Nama and Hevahero people will not talk about reparation. We are fully aware of that. We have been challenging our government on that one. They are mum on that one. We have been trying to exert pressure on the German government to talk to us. We have been sending petitions. We have been halting demonstrations back home and also here in, in Berlin. We put a motion in the Namibian parliament through the late Paramount Chief Riruako that was unanimously adopted by the Namibian government of the Namibian parliament. That made us to, 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 to have some hope. But then after the adoption of the motion, it was put under the table until five years 2011, when the mover of the, of the motion went back to parliament and asked what happened to the motion, when are we going to 
implement it. The motion was very clear because it was drafted by us and we knew what we were doing. Today, the Namibian government is moving away from that motion, which was clear that the, Namib the, the German government will sit with the victim communities and our government being the facilitator of mediator of that process. The Namibian government has moved away from that position. They are now directly negotiating, negotiating in inverted commas with the uh, German government. Yesterday, I heard that reparation cannot be solved through legal or through a legal route, but we can solve that through political process. I do not agree with that one. For the simple reason that Reparation for me or for us is a legal aspect. That is why we also have various international framework for reparations. And how could we, in a country where the majority that are in the ruling have never been affected by the genocide, and they do not associate themselves with the genocide. Do we have a, a just political environment for me to say, fine, let me leave it to the two governments? No, we cannot do that. Because our African governments, unfortunately, are corrupt. are still financially relying on the superpowers that have been oppressing our people. So there is political maneuver there, political manipulation. And therefore, the Nama and Ovahero people will be very stupid to believe that we can rely on the moral you know, obligation of, our, of the two governments. Currently, we are hearing about the talks between the two governments. We have said from the beginning, we are not part of those talks. And I want to clarify why we are saying we are not part of those talks. The two governments are talking about atrocities, the Nama and Ovahero people are talking about genocide. Why is the Namibian government not giving money to Cameroon or Togo, for example, if it is atrocities? They have to give us the answer. The two governments are talking about development. We are talking about reparation. Because reparation is for a specific group of people, a group of people that was, or where they, uh, well, that was targeted by genocide. Namas and Hereros are Namibians, that is true, we do not deny that. But there, was, there were two extermination orders against these people. Then von Trotter could have said, kill all the natives, but he was specific. And the, he also made sure, we just found out that in the archives in Botswana, this order was translated in Oshiherero so that my people could clearly understood what the intent was. Then it was also translated in the Netherlands for the Nama people to understand because they could speak Afrikaans. So that is the intent that we are talking about. That is the genocide that we are talking about. So the political climate is not just at the moment in Namibia. For us to simply just think that 
we will follow the political path. Now I'm going to the legal route that we have taken. 5 January 2017, the NAMA and over Hero people instituted a class action lawsuit in the district court in New York. The question was, why not in Namibia or in Germany? Namibia, of course, for the political reasons that I have just outlined, we could not go there. Germany, of course, how could we come to a court of the people that we are dragging to court? Because at the moment, even with the talks, it's like when you have someone who is a rapist and he has to decide himself whether I'm guilty or not. And if I happen to find myself guilty, what punishment will I give myself? Is that fair? So, two times the German government failed to appear in court, claiming that we are a sovereign state we cannot be judged in a court in another country. But on the 25th of this month, the German government was in court because they sent a legal representative by the name of Jeffrey Harris. He was in court. That means to us that the German government appeared in court because their representative was there. For us, that was a very positive movement. It's a very significant development in the case. It's a gently forward to us. I know that Germany is still adopting the attitude of we are a sovereign state. I'm not a lawyer, I said I'm a social worker. But somewhere I know that. When it comes to the case of genocide, there is no state immunity because that is a crime against humanity. I also know that there is no time lapse for the case of genocide. The lawyers will help me to understand that. So, the court at the moment for us uh, is just one route, just one plan of the many. I'm about to finish. We have many other plans. In the past, we also instituted a court in New Jersey that failed. And people said we lost. We said, no, we didn't lose. We learn out of it. So this time around also, we will not lose. We either win or we learn again out of it. Yes. <laughs> the importance of this court case for us is simple. The fact that we are keeping the case alive. I'm sure that the two governments the Namibian and the German government at the moment are having sleepless nights. And they are calling each other to see how can we, you know. So we are attracting the attention of the legal experts. And I'm sure this Alien Tort Claims Act, it's a very old one that is not really being used, you know, so often. But I'm sure for the lawyers, the academics, the researchers, you have a case of reference now. So that is what it means to us. In conclusion, Germany can hide, can run, but they will not hide. The Nama and over Herero people will follow the Federal Republic of Germany to the end of the world. I thank you.
Exacto, gracias. Thank you very much. And let me add maybe to that um, also one observation we already have. I mean, with the court case, also you, you forced Germany to, to react to what your, your action to, to take a position to um, uh, make a decision what, what to do with it. And I think that's also one part already, which is, um, as you pointed out, that the governments um, are certainly talking to each other um, and also closely following. Um, I guess what what we are saying here and and and, and the media coverage around it, um, but you also force the German government to take a position either to negotiate with you directly because that's what you usually do if there is a civil claim that before it goes to the judge you um, talk to each other and um, I mean that's one of your objectives and basically it's also one of your rights which you base on the um, UN Convention um, on the. Um, uh, rights of indigenous people, um, which is um, a, a new law, but it's, a, um, it's something also Germany recognizes, so it's not coming from somewhere. Um, and I mean, Germany first tried two or three times not to accept service of the lawsuit. Um, that's, of course, a position saying we don't want to enter this frame. And then at one point, the um, um, basically felt um, forced to um, make also legal arguments on the state immunity issue and going a bit more detailed into US law, into the Foreign States Immunity Act, which says in general there is immunity, but there are exceptions. And one exception is the expropriation and violation of international law. And so Germany made really detailed arguments, um, which, um, and that's something we heard yesterday in the presentations um, about international law. Um, the way you make these arguments and referring back to what the law was in 1904 in the years, basically you are um, 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 perpetuating and, 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 and re, um, reinforcing um, colonial laws by the way you argue such a case um, with, with the law from the time. And so, I mean, Germany 2018 had the that's a chance to enter negotiations to talk to you or to make legal arguments um, based on, on colonial laws um, saying that the over here were no, no state, no people, no subject in international law, which I think you can certainly um, question if we ever don't follow the pure European colonial views on international law at the time. Um, and at the same time arguing that the over here were under German law, and there was no specific colonial legal system, so the expropriation was lawful, and, and as a consequence, there's state immunity, which is also exposing, I think, um, um, the way Germany is, is dealing with that, and which might have also consequences for German diplomacy um, way beyond this case. So I think uh, whatever comes out of this case, I mean, you, you're forcing Germany to take a position, Germany now took a position, and, and I think that's quite um, remarkable already. But again, many lawyers, you're right, are um, following that here. It, it will trigger debates and, 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 and legal articles, um, I'm pretty sure. And um, also on the way how you argue such cases and if you re want to refer again to, to public international law of, the, um, of 110 years back um, on, and this argumentation. Um, so, um, I mean, following from that, um, um, the court now said there will be a next hearing in, uh, in May, um, and so both parties have time to put in more, more arguments. Um, maybe you can say a little bit what, what you have planned until then, what your activities um, around there in the next time, how you want to address it and, and um, keep the media um, attention which is um, um, already there? Or do you also expect now the German government approaching you um, to before the May uh, hearing? Um, the case is in court, what do you say? sub -judicalo. yes. So I would not respond to it now and we will wait until the, the 3rd of May. 
But uh, of course, it's still, you know, <laughs> mobilization and, uh, you know, advocacy work, that will still continue. That will still continue. So we are not going back and rest and wait until the 5th of May. We, we will still, you know, fight and, yeah. For us, it's still a luta continua. Yeah. Mm -hmm. May I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask you a very short question. Would you agree with Rachel Anderson's argument that um, that uh, the customary international law was in fact violated? So do you think it's a valid argument? Then you can't argue um, it wasn't against the law by 1904. Well, I guess what you had already at 1904 were um, some treaties um, even, not only customary law, but yeah. also treaties, um, how um, at least European states um, um, have restrictions in, their, in, in wars um, against each other. Yeah. And um, if, if you look back into what's, what makes, makes a state under international law, which means you have, you have a people, you have a territory, you have some hierarchies or structures, yeah. which were there, as you quoted already, some of the exchanges um, even before um, the colonial rule of the groups, so which shows that there's a, um, an organized um, entity. Um, um, of course, you can also argue why does that not comprise um, um, a state, so what's, what's the difference here? So there, there could be some arguments around that. And on the other hand, the question in general, I think, is um, if, if colonial law um, as such um, basically can be recognized as law. I mean, um, it was a, a tool of oppression. It was not um, a legal system for, for, for justice or for equality. And so that's, I think this question basically goes back um, if, if a court, and I would be very much interested also in a US position on that because it might be different than a European position on that I'm, I'm taking from the time, um, what, what basically constitutes um, law and statehood, and there are more and more um, um, voices also in, in legal literature um, which, which, are, which are questioning the, the, the pure European perspective on international law from, from 1900 in the time. Yeah, and the so-called African customary law was uh, recognized by the Germans, so they recognized an indigenous law system. No? And why shouldn't then apply international law not to Namibian people? No? But exactly. Yeah. Um, but maybe you can, um, Esther, you can um, tell us a little bit more. Um, um, when did you decide to go back to court again? In, um, because there were the courts in uh, the, the lawsuits in 2001 until around 2007, also against um, companies, which which points directly also to the economic interest of, of private actors in that and um, also um, against the German state at the time. So you fight against both entities um, to expose who, who also profited um, um, from, from the genocide. And um, when did you decide to, to go back to court because you felt, um, well, that's not the right moment or that's the, that's the time where we need to involve again also um, um, legal activities, um, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. So when we realized that the Nama and Ovahero people's rights to self-determination is has been violated by both governments, and that is in back in 2016, when the two governments started with their talks, and when they were clear that by December, 2016, they will conclude their discussions. So we wanted then to make sure that uh, before December, before they conclude, we have one or the other way that can block this conclusion of the discussions. And that is the time when we engage this lawyer. And um, then when the Namibian government um, picked up that we are engaging this lawyer. We were called several times to the state house, and uh, we were engaged by our own government. 
And um, December came, and to our surprise, there was no conclusion. And then it was like February 2017, we will conclude. So on the 5th of January then, we instructed the lawyer to institute the case. So that was when we realized that the two governments have no intention of including us in the process. And um, of course, at the moment, we hear that um, the Namibian special envoy is a Herero. So what is our problem then? We are also being told that in his team, he has got some representatives from the Nama and of our Herero communities. So what is wrong with us? We are saying, in the first place, Dr. Z. Gaviru is appointed by the Namibian government. It's not our choice. So he is representing the interest of the Namibian government, not the interest of the communities, of the Nama and Herero communities. And two, even if he has these people on his team, he is the one talking to Mr. Pollens. Now we are saying we want to sit and talk for ourselves because we are the people who know the pain, the abject poverty that we have inherited. We are the people who have brothers and sisters living today in the diaspora who have lost their culture who cannot speak their language. We have Herreros living in the southern part of Namibia, a place called Falkras. They refer themselves to Nama-speaking Herreros because they cannot speak their own language. They have lost that. So that is the, all these things that made us to, okay, well, you are not talking to groups because we are nothing in your eyes. Where else can we go where we can at least try to protect our rights to speak for ourselves? And that is when we went uh, to the U.S. court. And maybe also one question, how do you follow the case and how you make sure that um, um, over here in, in Namibia can follow the case um, and also you, or a number of your representatives also always went when they were hearing so far to, to the courthouse. So um, can you say a little bit more about this aspect, how to um, include that, and also to put it back into the um, more Namibian politics, um, and, and likewise also in, into Germany. And I mean, here it was already this week quite successful, I think, with almost all major newspapers reporting about it. Um, our history our culture is very, it's a life culture. So we have different ways of keeping memories. Every year, three times or four times a year, we are coming together uh, during very important dates uh, of the battle with the Germans. And that is how we keep people informed. Because uh, we also you know, cannot rely on our media because it's, it's, it's not free or independent press. So we, we, we make use of our own commemorative events where we keep our people updated as to what is happening and where are we now. And as people, you know, those that went to the, to the, to the case, they are leaving, they are going back uh, tomorrow to Namibia when they arrive, there will be community meetings to inform communities as to what transpired and what can be, you know, what can we expect and so on. And mind you that our communities are very, very much into this issue. Maybe Germany never went to court because they thought that we will not have enough money to travel. <laughs> but our communities are so organized that the few cattle from those that they stole. Every community member donate a kettle. 
and they sell that, and that is how we pay for tickets for people to travel to attend this court case. That is how important that case is to our people. Bernardus, coming to you and um, your, your struggle, especially on land reform and land rights, um, which also goes into, into this history here and also the court cases and, and the situation today. Um, so can you say a little bit, um, also as a background for audience and participants here, um, so what's the, what's the, how does it look like, the current land situation? Uh, the farmers' um, positions, um, what's your struggle on that and how this also relates to reparations um, um, you're requesting um, from, from Germany. Thank you very much and uh, good, good morning to everyone. Um, there are three professions that can disappoint very badly. Professors, politicians and pastors. I'm neither a professor, nor a pastor, nor a politician. I'm just an activist, so I'm sure I will not disappoint. <laughs> law is politics, and politics is law. And sometimes professors like to compartmentalize law, international economic law, criminal law, procedural law, and, and that's why some people are now even trying to get us stuck into, was it genocide, was it not genocide? Was it recognized then? Was it not recognized then? And we're just saying, go do your research. Because would you think honestly that from the point of view of errors and numbers, and I happen to be numbers, just look at my thick lips and my flat nose and my hair that does not come together. That's how they look like. They called people that look like me hot and taut. Uh, no one can expect us to say, no, it was not genocide. It would be stupid for us to say there was no genocide and the laws were not, <laughs> were not recognizing genocide. We will look for laws and we have found them, customary international law and all over the place. There are laws that you can find, treaties that were signed, that were entered into by the European countries. The other time when I was here with Eva then, I met the Deputy Prosecutor General, former Deputy Prosecutor General of of the ICC, one of the things that he said was that in prosecuting matters in international law, it may seem difficult, but the good part of international law is that you can pull so many legal instruments together and get something binding. So in respect of the law, we think we're onto something, very much so. From 1850 upwards, the instruments that Germany and others signed, they're important reference points, points to tell us that in a court of law, it will stand the test of time. But you asked about the question of land. Now, human lives we can't go and get back. We can't. We, we, we are talking about skulls and, and things like that that we can get back. Uh, we need those skulls back. I mean, my great-grandfather, Fredericks, was one of those that was slaughtered uh, by, by the Germans, and we are still looking for his skull here, somewhere. Someone must, must give us that skull back. But land and cattle and goats and sheep, oh yes, they are there in Namibia. We just cut the wire, as we were telling the other colleagues, and go get the cattle, go get the sheep, go get the, the land, and, and we can solve it. Very simple. But we are also law-abiding citizens, and we try to follow the law as much as possible. One of the good things that colonizers knew was that they must apply the law. So when they started to settle, already in 1895, they had two decrees. One that created the communal reserves. In other words, one law that already expropriated land of the Ovajero and the Nama. And then another decree that led to the sequestration of all land cattle, uh, of rather all land and all properties of the indigenous people. So you had two instruments, two decrees, that were used to take livestock and land and all other properties, including women, 
from the Hereros and the Namas and exactly transfer that wealth in the hands of the German settlers. The challenge that you have is when you have, and the professor spoke yesterday about the law has not answered many things. The law is stupid. I am not so sure whether I agree with the professor that the law is stupid. Perhaps the law is conservative, but stupid it ain't because the human agents that must implement the provisions of the law, those ones are often the ones that are either stupid, they don't understand it, and they are cowardice. If you look at the decrees that von Trotter issued under the instructions of Kaiser Wilhelm, or those decrees that were issued by the Kaiser himself who had a problem with one of his arms, who was a brutal guy. He was actually a little bit of a madman, I'm, I'm reading, a very crazy guy who had emotional issues. I wanted to see at least a picture of him. Must have been a very ugly guy, I must say. Um, if you look at the European colonial enterprise, they promulgated their stupid laws, according to the professor, but they implemented those laws, no matter what. So you had those provisions first to take the livestock and the land, and then they then reduce it further into ordinances to say specific groups, the Swart boys, where I come from, the Friedrichs, the Franzmann, specific groups of Namas, we must take livestock. The Eastern Herero, they took livestock, and so on. Just to give you an idea, by 19, 1914, let me just verify the date. By 1914, 1902, by the way, the Hereros were only left with 46,000 cattle out of 140, 50,000 cattle. And the settlers had about 46,000 cattle. You can see the transfer of wealth. So, the laws were used to take property. You will see I'm just vacillating between that period and now. Now, when you now come to independence, and now you have this Western liberal constitutions, you have a government. The law provides for expropriation with just compensation. And some of you are law students, and professor will say, the law does not look at the economic monop monopolies that you need to break down. We dealt with the political ones, but we do not deal with the economic ones. The law provides, for instance, in the Constitution for expropriation. What do you expropriate? You expropriate land for just, with just compensation and for public interest. If the law is not used to correct an economic imbalance. Is it the problem of the law or is it the problem of the implementers? Is the law stupid or are the implementers stupid or unwilling? You are students, you'll have to ask that question yourself. Ask your professors. Because professors, you know, sometimes they are in another, another world. <laughs> and I respect them, of course. Now, Let's go back again. Remember, I will take you back and forth so that, so that you be with me. Be with me on this issue. Back and forth. Now, the Germans targeted specific communities, Mr. Moderator. They didn't target the Ovambo and the Gavango and the Zambezi. The German commentators say that because the Ovambos were 150,000, the Germans were afraid to tackle them because they were not militarily strong. That's a lie. Mr. Ulenga comes from the government of the Republic of Namibia. He's the deputy ambassador sent here to perhaps spy on us. I'm seeing his writing. Let him write. <laughs> they just never had anything to offer to the Germans. There was malaria, land was not fertile, water was scarce, there were no minerals, and until today you can see that the south of the red line, that the Germans put a line dividing the country in the north and south zone. The north close to Angola, 
still they cannot export livestock to Europe. South of the Red Line, where the Ovaherero and the Nama and the Damara left, that's the economic powerhouse of Namibia. Yes. Has always been. You can't argue it. Diamonds, everything, good livestock, sheep, fish, it's from the southern part of the country. So the Germans had no interest to go upward. So they had to deal with 89.3 million hectares of land. When they settled by 1915, Germany had given the settlers about 1,331 farms. And in 1914, when they did a census as to the wealth of the Germans, Germans are very efficient. They were good at killing very fast. They were good at enriching Germans also very quickly. 1914, when they did a census as to how rich the Germans are, the settlers that just came yesterday, they found that those that came yesterday were 20 million marks rich. 14 million of that 20 million was cattle and other livestock that they took from the Herreros and the Namas. In 1914, therefore, by law, which was brutally implemented, someone was 14, 20 million dollars or, or marks rich, someone was 20 million marks poor. We know who was rich, we know who was poor. In total, during a war period where they were killing people, and some Germans were also killed, of course, in 25 years, Germans took about 13.4 million hectares of land. Let me put that in perspective. The government of the Republic of Namibia, represented by Mr. Ulenga here, in 27 years, only bought 3.1 million hectares of land in a time of peace, with laws available at their disposal to expropriate land for purposes of returning land in a time of peace. In other words, when you can do whatever you, you, you are allowed to do. Besides that, you have two-thirds majority. In other words, you have the super majority, not like poor Angela Merkel that has to fall around seeking for coalition partners. You have a two-thirds majority out of 96 parliamentary seats. You have 77 seats. That's how big you are. Law is politics. Politics is law. Let me now go back to you about why Germany did not go to the north. I told you there was nothing in the north. There remains nothing in the north except cheap labor where Ulenga comes from. Now, the government, of course, is dominated by people from an ethnic group that comes from the north, that never lost a single inch of land, that never lost a single life. Yes. They claim that apparently Nehale went to decimate the Germans at Fort Namutoni. <laughs> and I read this book, there were 500 of Ambo soldiers that went to fight, fight seven German soldiers. Seven. Only one German soldier was injured and 150 of Ambo soldiers were killed. They ran off. Today, that is the ethnic group that is leading us. That is the ethnic group that has no understanding of genocide, of loss of land. They claim there was a very fantastic revolution that they freed the country. There was no revolution. It was just the Western five countries sitting in a hotel and saying, we draft 82 principles, free ju uh, independent judiciary, free media. Uh, you boys, do you agree to these principles? All right, go, you have a constitution. What is the date you want to be independent? Go and be independent, more or less. 
Of course, had it not been for the Cubans, there would not have been a claim for some military credentials. So we are stuck in this process, the question of the law. Who has to manage and implement the law? <laughs> Who has to get your land back for you? So you are asking the question, for instance, why did we not go to, to the German courts uh, for reparations and so Who reports Satan to devil? devil? You, you can't report Satan to devil, they are the same thing. The Namibian government works for the German government. That is why they have accepted a horrible relationship between Germany and Namibia to be called a special relationship. Not sure what is so romantic about it. I mean, you killed people, you suddenly call a relationship very special. Horrible relationship. But depending on who is at the head of that country, as head of state, you'll accept a relationship to be defined because your ethnic group did not lose life. So for you, it's special. And a couple of billion of dollars is what makes it special. Now, on the land question, therefore, the Ovaherero and the Nama in 100 years of colonialism lost 89.3 million hectares of land. That includes land that was converted into nature parks, land that was converted into commercial farms, land that was given for mines, the Oppenheimers and the Rothschilds and, and many others. That is, that is the land. And this is the land we want back. We now have Germans that still stay in Germany and go for hunting once in a year. These are the farms that we think we should probably invade, Zimbabwe style, almost. You can clap hands. I mean, I don't think it will be really Zimbabwe style, but close to it. No bloodshed. All we will do since the boss is not there is to cut the fences, chase our cattle, and occupy the land. When the boss comes from Germany, he will find new neighbors having settled in on his farm. So we can coexist. Why? Because we are told we are a peaceful and stable country. So why would an absentee landlord go and disturb peace and stability? We are only sharing out of a special relationship, the resources that exist in the country, yeah? So, the law that we have is not being used, Mr. Moderator. The land we want to be returned. Unfortunately, Angela Merkel and Poland them are from the East German pocket. They were together with Swapo. Swapo, and its government are essentially mafias. They are a bunch of thieves and crooks that have stolen the treasury of the Republic of Namibia bankrupt in 27 years. Remember the Germans enriched the Germans. The point, Dr. Kostler, is that once a country's treasury is stolen bankrupt, even if you now have to go and expropriate land, you will not have resources to pay just compensation. The point is that land, just as genocide, is not as important for the ruling elite because it's not something that they know. It's not something that interests them. What interests them is a few million euros from Germany. What interests them are red carpets and to be called excellencies. But it's a mafia. If in 25 years, Germany could transport settlers from here, make them rich, kill people, give them land. If in 75 years of occupation, the Afrikaners from South Africa could give further land to the white community there, solve the white Afrikaner problem and not bankrupt the state, what does it tell you about the capacity of the government to implement the laws that they have on the books? If in 27 years you bankrupted the economy, you are hoping that the Germans 
because Angela Merkel, being from East Germany, is going perhaps to be very nice to you because you were partners in some sort of liberation, the East Germans helping Namibia then, that you will get the money of genocide and refinance your treasury. That was the strategy. And that's why we had to, amongst others, go to court. Idea was to refinance a bankrupt state. Why is the law not also used? My, my second last point. If you return land to the Ovaherero and the Nama and the Damara, balance of power will change. Balance of power will change. If today you go to Namibia, you find people in the corridors with cattle or goats or sheep, it will be a Herero a Damara or a Nama. Ovambo, Kavango, and all other people are on their ancestral lands. Nobody touched them. If you find street children, homeless people, it will be from these ethnic groups. These are the people that you will be told as ambassadors and visitors and tourists are the lazy ones. If we give the land to them, they will make it unproductive. They are useless. They can't tell the land. It is from the blood and the resources of these so-called lazy, useless Hereros and Namas that Germans live a first world life in Namibia. It's from these resources. So you basically have caught up in the genocide debate the land debate. And in these two debates, you have caught up a corrupt government that needs to sideline these communities in order to continue to benefit from a special relationship. And they are at least not even financing development projects with this money. There was a time that Germany sent about over 100 million marks specifically for the northern communities. And we challenged the Germans that you say that the money must come to everyone, how do you give money to one ethnic group? All I'm telling you all at the end of the day is, since German colonialism, since South African colonialism, we have not known freedom. Country is independent, we are not free. Go and look at the new land owners. The Germans took land gave to the ethnic German group. The Afrikaners took land, gave to the ethnic Afrikaner group. The Swapo regime takes land and gives to the Ovambo ethnic group. That's plain, raw, ethnic politicking. That's the situation. At some stage, we were apparently this beacon of hope. But I think this country, Namibia, continues to be a beacon of tears. And so we have organized ourselves in the Landless People's Movement to begin to challenge from a legal point of view, but also from a political point of view, this matter of land. Because the argument is that Article 16, Subsection 2 of the Constitution allows for expropriation for uh, public interest with just compensation. Land dispossession is not recognized as a public interest criteria for, who, for which land must be expropriated. It is not. Right now as I speak, about 600 farms are on the market. In other words, anyone can buy them. What that means is that the state has used the law to waive those farms, to say, go sell them anyway. Those 600 farms amount to about 5 million hectares of land, but it's not put available to anyone that can buy. And you know that the Hereros and the Namas <laughs> don't have that type of resource. You have corruptly and out of ethnic policies empowered your ethnic group with fishing quotas. I'm sure even if in the embassy of Namibia, I'm seeing Kapanda is there, this is the same ethnic group. In the embassy of Namibia, here you are probably likely to find one language speaking group. 
cabinet in Namibia, 99.9% .9 one language group, ministers, deputy ministers, ambassadors, those that get the tenders that are rich, apart from the whites, is one ethnic group. They fought for the freedom of the country. They liberated the country. And, 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 and it's not true. There was no liberation of a country. How could you fight South Africa that was so powerful with machetes and you think you have won, you want us to? We don't even know. Uh, the extent of certain things, of course we know. Uh, the atrocities that were committed against our people. So, in respect also of the land question, the ANC in South Africa has decided that they are going to expropriate land without compensation. <coughs> Professor, the law now. The ANC is waking up that out of 58 million South Africans, only 35,000 South Africans who are white own more than 60% of the land. So the thing about expropriation and land reform is gaining momentum. At the same time, the Germans seem not to want to recognize the difficulty that they are placing on themselves and on the local German population. Our young people are tired and they may not want to use the laws per se, but they may want to practically go and expropriate land using their own guns, using their own handmade weapons to take the land. So the question therefore is, is the special relationship with Germany a relationship of justice, of peace, of equity? Is it the relationship recognizing genuinely its historic obligations? Is it the relationship that we can depend on to produce the kinds of things that any person aspires for in society? And the question is, if it was so special, why is it that the government of Germany cannot speak to these special people who happen also to be Herero, also to be Nama, but are also Germans? Is it special? And who decides the specialness of the relationship? Is it Berlin or is it Ventuk? Who decides that? I leave it so far. I was uh, uh, um, very touched by the work that you do here, and I will urge you to do some of these conferences in Namibia as well. Because just like colonialism, things are done here and few of us have to travel here. We are happy that you are doing it. But back home, these things need to be heard more, need to be seen more. And the work of some of the good German people must be seen, must be heard more in Namibia, not in the confines of a nice uh, building here in Berlin. Yeah, so far. Thank you very much, and I mean, for all of us here, it's a privilege that you are here, but um, I think, uh, and, and especially also to hear your voices and views, and not Germans talking about German colonial history, um, but, but I'm pretty sure that we and the organizers will also take up your suggestion to um, have an exchange and a dialogue in all places. Um, we have some time left, um, and I would like to collect some questions from the audience, 
so collecting them so that we can then all um, um, together um, answer some of those aspects here. Um, and we have microphones there. Um, so maybe, yeah, with the two here. So we start first with the um, lady to the left. Yeah, microphones here. My name is Ginga Eichler. I'm belonging to the group who is demanding from the German government not only an excuse but also to talk to the Herrera and Nama. Uh, and I'm uh, absolutely in favor of no talk about us without us. Um, but I have two questions. Thank you very much for, especially for Esther and also Gesine and uh, Bernardus. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, I'm not a scientist, and I'm sort of also perhaps to be too old to look uh, at all the documents every time and so on. I'm more an activist, and I'm trying to uh, force the German government because it is our, the Germans, duty to do so. I want to know, and I've heard a lot about the special treaty, the special relationship to Namibia between Germany, the now German government, and uh, Namibia is also part of the GDR, and I'm from the GDR, and I was always on the side of the Swapo people to liberate the country, um, is also based on the money and also perhaps weapons and so on. Uh, to uh, uh, the SWAPO, the SWAPO agreements and the GDR um, help for the SWAPO to, to, to liberate Namibia. I wonder if anybody in the, in the house knows if this is documented in the papers of uh, uh, Namibian uh, Declaration of Independence in the contract after the war, the war came down with the new German government. Uh, this is one. And second, um, as I'm always, I, I was always at the side of the uh, oppressed uh, and colonized people of Africa. It has been one of my uh, aims in life to do something against racism from my side, from the German side, I wonder um, how the lessons also of um, the socialist ideas and socialist countries and the help for this uh, decolonization uh, um, fight, how the lessons have been learned. And I see with disappointment that it seems that at least some, I don't know, I could not speak for all of the SWAPO members, but some of these people have not learned our lesson, that you have to listen to the people, that once you're in power, it's not done. The revolution is not done if you don't listen to the people. And I'm very thankful for what you said, but I still, this is my question. Thank you. Uh, Reinhard Kössler, uh, I'm involved in research and some activism in the issue for a long time, and uh, I don't, don't want to pose a question, but uh, add a comment, I hope very briefly. And uh, my comment is on uh, the uh, apparent uh, strategy of the German government in this case. Uh, in 2015, July 2015, the German government the Foreign Office, let it be known that they would change their language now to use the word of genocide uh, uh, on what has happened in Namibia in 1904-1908. Uh, the th point is, it was never put into writing, there was not even a press statement, it was just made known on a, in a seemingly informal way at a press conference. In actual fact, I think this was very well considered, this way of dealing with it. Some uh, weeks later, 
in Namibia, German diplomats said, it is not a legal issue, it is only a moral and historical issue. And lately, last year, from, uh, we hear uh, no longer reference to genocide, uh, but atrocities. Mm. Uh, so uh, the thing is, my, my uh, reading of that is, uh, they realized uh, genocide has a legal import. Mm. Uh, so uh, let's rather retract mm. from that. Mm. And at the same time, this negotiation process, whatever else, it may be its merits or demerits, was started with the idea, we talk about the way the German state will, or the German government will apologize. That is part of the negotiations. When, wherever in the real world, when you have to apologize for a very serious issue, will you uh, make sure that uh, how, how you apologize? You have to apologize sincerely and run the risk even that it, the apology is not accepted. So uh, to this day, the um, important first step that would clear very much away that the Bundestag over there would uh, pass a motion simply to state what has, ha what has happened, we are sorry, and let's sit down and talk, has not been happening. That is really wanting, and I think that is for us as uh, German uh, citizens, as far as we are German citizens here in this room, something we really have to uh, stand up for and campaign for. Thank you. Thank you, and I think here was another question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for um, a wonderful panel. And I just want um, um, a couple of compliments and, and um, maybe a couple of questions. So uh, thank you so much, um, Jacine, uh, for um, wonderful, um, offering a wonderful example of how, how we can do politics with history and why history is a political issue. Uh, I think what um, your 30 minutes intervention was kind of uh, uh, the best rendition that I have seen about that in many uh, years. And the question then is, uh, uh, you mentioned at some point that there was this silence in uh, historical thinking, academic historical thinking in Germany about the situation of uh, the, this uh, hor uh, horrific event. But then it was a revival in the 60s and there was a couple of those seminal books happening in the East and the West. And I'm just uh, wondering what we can learn from that revival. And in particular, what, is, what are the difference or the different historiographical approaches of if there were different historiographical approaches, depending on, or, or, if we look closely at, at those two books. Um, I'm sure uh, the richness of thinking about history in Germany um, has been always about, uh, uh, in particular at that point, about how history was thought and, and reflected about on the, in the two sides of the, of the river. Um, so um, I just wonder to hear what you think about that. So uh, the two sides of the, the East and the West, uh, Germany. You say that it was these two books uh, in the 60s. Uh, so it, whether there was different historiographical approaches and what we can learn from those differences, if they were. Uh, and then I just I wanted to um, say, um, uh, Quick comment to um, Esther and Benares. Uh, thank you so much for what you have done today. And, um, and I, um, yesterday we spent all day um, afternoon thinking about, from an academic point of view, uh, about the importance of thinking critically about international law. And I think what you have done today is an, exactly what we uh, members of the, this loose group where, uh, called Third World Approaches to International Law, 12 aspire to inform and to support. Um, and one thing that we have been doing that is to say there's a close relationship between law and politics and what Bernardes was saying. And, and when we said law is not enough, I think it's, that's, that's what I want to intervene. When we say law is not enough, it's exactly because what practice demonstrates is that law is a political project. And without politics, they just no law. So, 
Um, I just want to say it. I wanted to say that just to be all on the same table. So what we tried to say yesterday is exactly what you are trying to do. So from our point of view, from academics committed to thinking, to thinking critically about international law, we are there to help and then to support your struggle. I think it's, what you're doing is exactly what, how we conceptualize um, international law. Thank you. And we have one more question then the back. Which I'd like to collect before we then answer from the panel. Um, yeah, I have one question regarding the uh, word shared history, and I find it conflicting. I've also heard sh uh, shared heritage in that context because I feel it disguises uh, responsibility, which is which is not a shared responsibility. And I would like to hear from Essa and Bernardus how how you see this. How we see what? Um, the word of shared history, but responsibility basically is on one side. All this relation. Is so does shared history mean shared responsibility? I didn't get it. Good. Well, thank you very much for the questions. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we do it also as the uh, as a concluding um, session. Um, so, uh, Gesine, would you like to start specifically with the um, question on the, the 60s, what um, changed there, but maybe also on other questions if you'd like to comment on, on the shared history question and the um, comment on, 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 on Germany and the use of the term genocide, um, not in documents, but only in a press conference. But feel free to take those questions you'd like to, to answer. Yeah. First, um, what, what was quite funny about the uh, Drexler's and Bly's work was that Drexler, the historian from the East, wrote a very conventional history, very conventional. Um, it was based on extensive archival work. He literally turned every page in the archives uh, he could get hold of. He first came to Namibia, um, I don't know, 1990-something, and it was very funny how he sort of reacted when he saw his subject uh, for the first time, and he was praised, of course, by Swapo politicians, and so on and so on, and he really didn't know what was going on there. So he was a very conventional historian, but I think what we can learn from his book is rigor and discipline when we sit in the archives. And he disclosed so much important facts, I think. And I must really say, after Drexler's book, there is no doubt anymore from a historical point of view, and I mean really um, a conservative historical work based on archival sources and not fancy theories, you know. So, there's absolutely no doubt about what was happening and that the Germans knew in Germany and in Namibia, the military, the missionaries, the farmers, they knew that there was a genocide uh, on its way. Yeah? And um, then um, there came out a lot of books on the German colonial history in West Germany, but um, it, I think it's a bit of a pity that um, our approach to, to develop a new sort of colonial history that is more African history and turn to African archives and uh, do oral history in Namibia and South Africa was not taken up very much. So a lot of young scholars are only interested in a very short period of time with Germany is so important. And, and African history, for instance, from the 17th or 18th or even 19th century is not of much interest. And I must say, I, um, I regret that, and it's quite interesting why this is happening. We have more and more global history, post-colonial history, but less and less African history or Asian history. Um, 
Yeah, I think I can leave it to that. I mean, I don't know what you think about the term shared history. When we developed the concept, uh, it was the German word geteilte Geschichte with this double meaning, divided and shared. And we wanted to show that um, on the one hand, there is a shared history, look at Namibia, look at the colonies, it's our history also, but you also wanted to say it's, it's not just our common history, but it's also divided because what the people in Namibia suffered is not our history, it's, it's Namibian history. I mean, it's our responsibility maybe, but not our history. So the term was used, it was not a very theoretical term, but we wanted to show this, this double meaning of divided and, and um, shared, yeah. But maybe there are better terms. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm talking about the yeah. 1980s, yeah? yeah. <laughs> sorry. 1990s, sorry, not 80s, 90s. Okay, <laughs> um, so we, we, we continue with the, with the other questions, and we got another 15 minutes by the organizers, so that just that you know why uh, we, we take some more time um, before we break um, for the lunch. And, uh, and there are some questions, and, and it's certainly something you should um, respond to. Um, so th um, th there was, um, on the un one hand, the, the question, um, I mean, how do you um, um, perceive it that the term genocide, um, or that basically also the um, talks or negotiations, what you said, um, are kind of secret, so there's no written documents out there, we don't really know what's talking about, what's on the table there. So how do you perceive that? Um, and maybe to add also a bit from the German practice we have in the recent years when it comes to reparations, um, actually, it's um, if, you, if you go to a German military um, um, activities in, in, in the Afghan war, um, and if there are um, um, civilians um, who, who are killed, um, they, they get compensated, not much, but Germany pays some out of court ex gratia um, reparation directly um, to them, for example. So there is a, it's not unknown to the Foreign Office um, um, to, to talk about reparations in, in those contexts. And they, from a legal perspective, are also not, um, well, there are also a lot of arguments around that. Um, so how, how do you see, Esther, the, um, the secrecy of the talks, but also then, um, um, German positions in terms of other, uh, in other contexts. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I think there was also a question about uh, records or documentation right. on the agreement that we are referring to. <laughs> yeah. Um, we will not mention something that we are not sure of. We will not make reference to something that does not exist. There is a report of a certain researcher, we have the name of that researcher, who was employed or who was researching to see whether the Nama and of Aero people have really a case against the German government. And in his report, is while he was doing the research, is where he also came up about the agreement that was signed. And um, usually when we mention that, we don't want to go deep into it. Because we are waiting for someone from the, either the Namibian government or the German government to say, we are lying. We have been saying that the, for the past three, four, two years now, but still no one is coming out and that confirm what we are saying. On the issue of the current talks being done in secrecy, um, maybe I should mention that for us, the whole process have started on a very shaky, wrong foundation. 
uh, it still shows it, it, it's a power relationship. Because Germany suggested to our government that we have come up with a special envoy. We also want you to employ one. <laughs> so you still sit in Berlin and decide what needs to be done. It reminds me of the Berlin Conference of 1884. The process where we're saying it's wrong, it's wrong in the sense that what is the basis of the discussions between the two governments? At least the Namibian government, we know that there was a solution in terms of the motion that was adopted in the parliament. The German government, all the motions have been rejected. So what is the basis of the talks? And while the talks are happening, are taking place, you hear a different story from Mr. Polens. You hear a different story from Dr. Z. Gavire. You hear a different story from the German ambassador in Namibia. And that confuses us. Because it's like people in the same choir, but they are singing different songs. It confuses us. So we don't know what they are discussing. Then one is talking about, we will give you development aid. There's no way that we can pay reparation. Then another one is coming and saying, we are negotiating on reparations. We are confused. And we really want the two governments to help us to get rid of this confusion. <laughs> I, I, I read recently that the Polish, Poland, is also seeking compensation from the German government. And I want to see what would be or what is the attitude of the German government towards that? We are being told that do not compare your genocide with the Jewish Holocaust. Bernardes was in a meeting with the current ambassador in Namibia, where they stood up and left the meeting, because the ambassador was clear that we killed thousands of Jewish, but I mean, maybe a you know, few heroes and namas, come on. Do you want to tell me that one hero nama life is worthless? And it's not about a number, it's about the intent. So even if we were 10,000 and 1,000 were killed, the intent is what is more important to us. So the same German government that is paying the Jewish, where they sat with 23 groups of Jewish representatives with the state of Israel, is the same government refusing to talk to few heroes and namas, telling us that we don't talk to groups. We are a sovereign state. We only talk to a government. But you talk to the Jewish. Is it because they are white? They are Europeans? We are black and Africans? Or do you think that we don't have the mind to sit with you and talk to you? So that is purely a racist attitude that we are dealing with. So, reparation, restitution, compensation. As long as there is a herero and nama on this earth, we will continue demanding that from the German government. Thank you. Yeah, just on shared responsibility. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's important for, for young people, especially the German young people, to I agree with this point of shared responsibility because of shared history. It's very, very important because at the end of the day, we are all human beings and we want to live in peace side by side and, and we recognize that more than the shared history, we probably also have a shared future. And precisely because we want to sit and talk about the past and talk about how we should move on to a better future for all, the very fact that that is rejected makes you wonder how the German leaders look at this matter of shared responsibility. Mind you, we are not asking for donations in reparations. We are not asking for uh, assistance or development aid. We are asking for what we still consider to be ours. Remember the case that uh, Professor talked about, the Mabu case in Australia, where the Aboriginal people took the Australians to court. That case was very clear, and on the basis of that case, a number of decisions in the South African jurisdiction was taken. That case basically said that the principle of terra nullius that the colonizers used, in other words, that land here that we see does not belong to anyone, that principle is a fallacy. That terra nullius is a principle to take people's land cannot be accepted as a means to claim title legally to that land. And that therefore, the courts further went to say, if land that was taken from the indigenous people was not voluntarily given, and we can extend that to other properties, if it was not voluntarily given by those indigenous people, that land and those properties actually continue to exist as property of those very indigenous people. That's an important principle. And we are subscribed, subscribed to it. In South Africa, they gave land back that was taken forcefully by the British and others using that court case. And we are saying when we are asking for land, for compensation or reparations, it is not a favor of a master that must do a, a very noble act to a servant that we are posturing around uh, this question. It is the basic matter of repairing the harm that you have done or your, your, not the current generation, but your state has af afflicted upon people. So ours is actually a movement of peace, a movement that seeks to work together with every German person. We may not agree on every issue from time to time, that's normal, but surely we can agree on working together to find a solution to this challenge of humanity, which is genocide. And I think it's important for young people to, to, to ponder on this issue. How do, you, how do you participate in a process that is likely to redefine and renew and rekindle a genuinely special relationship with Namibia, away from the bloodshed, from the murder, from the genocide, from the pain? How do we together walk toward a better future? And who shares what responsibility? The responsibility of the German government in the least is to sit down. That's, that's the first responsibility. And we are asking for that. The second is to sit down genuinely and in good faith to talk. And thirdly, to say, how do we move forward? So I'll urge you to join the movement to really help people like Christian and those that are working here in, in Germany to foster that sense of a global movement around this matter of genocide. I think it's, it's so crucial for you young uh, German students that will be the leaders tomorrow also to, to look at that, 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 that question. It's very important. Yeah, thank you very much. And we are now coming to the end of this first panel today. Um, 
gesehen. And thank you very much for um, giving us uh, this, this historian perspective uh, with, with, I guess, uh, added quite some details which were not that, that known here beforehand because it's not uh, something you, you always come across, the, the regular reporting about it, uh, about the genocide, if, 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 if there is any. So thank you very much for joining us. And And Esther and Bernardo, thank you very much for coming to Berlin, for joining us here too, to giving your perspective, which I think was quite enriching and which will certainly be um, uh, not the last word, but uh, hopefully stimulate some more discussions and to be continued um, not only here, but hopefully also in Namibia um, with, with um, some um, exchange and um, yeah, collaboration. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And we continue at 1.30 with the second panel of today, um, looking into more um, legal interventions in Europe on um, colonial crimes. Thank you.